All right. Well, welcome everybody to another Bar Talk virtual chat. Uh, I'm Dave Summers, Executive Director of the Omaha Bar Association. And I am speaking this lovely afternoon here Thursday um, with Creighton Law Professor Steve Severson. Um, Professor Severson is known to many in the law community because they had him as a teacher, as a, a professor at Creighton School of Law. Also, he is known as our ethics expert um, at our annual ethics um, CLE, which hasn't happened yet in 2020, but uh, we, we will have it here soon. And so uh, we, we're bringing uh, Professor Severson on today to talk about a few different things, including his latest book. Um, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Appreciate it. Dave, I'm happy to be with you. So, uh, so first things first, I guess we should talk just a bit. Um, we're, we're going to have the ethics seminar at some point this year. And so all the OBA members that are chomping at the bit asking, you know, when's that free ethics CLE that I get with my membership? We'll be doing that in some, some way, somehow, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you and Scott Paul and I have been planning this thing since last year. And uh, I think you made the right call, Dave, uh, after talking with us, you made the right call to put it off. And uh, given how things are looking for public gatherings and all of that, I would think we'll uh, do the ethics seminar online. Everybody should be able to get their two hours very easily in the comfort of their own home, sitting in their jammies. And uh, it'll be the same program that we had planned. And uh, I think it'll work out just fine. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the rule is you can dress as casual as you want, but you have to pay as much attention as you would in person, right? The, the attention span can't be more casual. You gotta, still gotta pay attention to that screen. Don't put it behind three other screens as you're working away. You know, uh, there's something funny. I'm a member of the Washington State Bar and I have to get my 15 CLE credits every year and uh, I end up doing a few of those uh, by video. They're, they have a whole library of uh, videos available. But when you sign up and you start taking one of them, somewhere about 15 minutes in, uh, a little pop-up says, are you still watching? And then you <laughs> have to click, yes, I'm still watching. And I think they do that so you don't just turn the thing on uh, and walk away and, you know, go to the gym or something. So I don't know, something like every 15 minutes in a one hour video, you've got to confirm by clicking that you are still watching. Uh, I was kind of surprised the first time that happened. I don't, I don't see the effectiveness of it because you can do things for 15 minutes, pop back in and so on. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, it's, it's interesting how much technology has allowed us to continue to, to do the things um, that we've done for so long. You know, there's this new standard where you can get all of your um, CLE online. Uh, I think that for many years, people have sort of wanted that to be the standard. And so, and now it is, at least for this year, Chief Justice Hevekin has said um, that we can do it that way. We'll see what happens in the future. Uh, you know, if, well, if I've done it, get as more said, effective, I've... sorry. Yeah, no, as I said, I've, I've gotten a number of credits online and uh, my attitude is, of course, I'm going to watch. I mean, uh, you know, I get the point of CLE credits and I try to pick out something that I think will be useful to me. And when we do our ethics seminar, we try to make it uh, entertaining and useful. And so, you know, if you're going to have to do it, you know, get comfortable. Uh, open a beer or a soda and sit there and, and watch the program, uh, there's, you can actually get a lot and actually you can pause them. You, you know, right. you can pause, take care of something, carry on again. And so I think it's a very user-friendly thing and I think it's actually very educational. So I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, I'm happy that, that you and Scott and I can put our program on later this year. Absolutely. Now, we had Dean Frische on the Bar Talk virtual chat here a few weeks ago, um, over a month ago, and uh, you all had already gone to some online um, Zoom type uh, teleconferencing meetings with the students. I believe the semester's wrapped up. You have the three L's graduating. 
um, you have uh, the, the 2Ls going off and trying to figure out how to work this summer in, in the conditions that we're in. Um, how has that process been for you from somebody who's, who's been in the classroom for, for decades to now this online format? How has that been? Uh, I will say that, let's see, the decision was made at the beginning of our spring break in early March to go online for the rest of the semester. And uh, they put off the, the resumption of the semester for two weeks. So we had the spring break week and then the following week to get everything up. And I and uh, my other faculty colleagues were really scrambling during those two weeks to learn the technology, to figure out what we were gonna do, how we were gonna present the material and so on. So we were working pretty hard, but by the time we started then in mid-March, third week of March, uh, we were ready, I would say. Uh, I, you know, I kind of look at life as, as a party anyway. And you know, I, I love classroom teaching. The reason I teach is because I like being in the classroom, but I figured, this is just something that I can do that everybody else is doing. And uh, I'm not too old to learn new tricks. So no, I think it's been going very well. Uh, I, I, we'll see what the students have to say about it. But uh, for example, I made extra efforts during those last six or seven weeks of the semester to have live Zoom meetings where uh, optional, where students could call in, visit with me. And in one of my, sm in my smaller class, I had one-on-one -on -one meetings and, and pairs of students that I met with. So I actually think I spent more time individually face-to-face -face with them online through Zoom than I might have in the semester. I could teach a whole semester and not have more than a fleeting conversation with some of them. So uh, you can build it into where the, the, I know people get sick of Zoom and sick of the, the, the whole video look of things, but uh, personally, I find it stimulating and I, I'm actually enjoying the process. I, I wish we didn't have to, but if you got to do it, uh, why not have fun in the process? So uh, I think it's going very well. The summer school is actually just starting the summer session at Creighton and uh, it's all online, uh, including the new class coming in on the accelerated program who are just starting. Uh, it's all online, and as I said uh, to you before we started the recording, uh, we are being told that we'd better be prepared to offer the fall semester online, even though the current plan is to open up uh, for live teaching uh, starting in August. We'll see how it plays out, but basically we've got to prepare for two classes for each subject, one online and one live, and uh, so I think we'll all be busy this summer. But again, I'm not a complainer. I, I, like, I like this. I mean, it, it's really interesting. And I've learned so much uh, in the technology. And Creighton has some good tools for the online uh, recording and live meetings and through Zoom. Absolutely. Um, now, we're, we're chatting today uh, in part because uh, you have a new book that came out, and uh, for those who remember a couple of years ago at the Ethics Seminar at Creighton, uh, you had your your other book, and I'm not sure if you've written more than two books, but at least two the visual aid. Yeah, the Naked Mountaineer. Yeah, yeah. Um, you were signing copies of that after the Ethics Seminar. Yeah. Yes, I did. <laughs> so, so this and, was a, this was a memoir of uh, my climbs uh, a, a few decades ago where I was lucky enough to be traveling around the world on business and for other reasons. And I was getting in some very interesting mountain climbing. This is when I was a lawyer in Seattle and I was an active mountaineer uh, as, a, as a hobby during my law practice years in Seattle. So that book uh, came out uh, five years ago, published by the University of Nebraska Press. And then uh, a few summers back, my wife and I spent 90 days in Britain uh, in a rented car and did a 90 day road trip throughout uh, the British Isles. And that then became the subject of my second one. And there it is, it's called Low Mountains or High Tea Misadventures in Britain's National Parks. Another armchair 
travel book. There is some mountain climbing in it, but mountain climbing in Britain is not that big a deal. The highest point in the whole country of the United Kingdom is 4,500 feet above sea level, like 500 feet less than Denver. Uh, so, so the mountain climbing part is more of a hiking experience. And uh, a lot of the book has to do with the cultural aspect and the fact that my wife and I had entirely different ideas on how we would spend our summer in Britain. She wanted to hang out in tea rooms and pubs. That's the high tea part. And I wanted to go hiking. That's the low mountains part. And so the, the book has a lot of the, uh, how can you say, tug of war between my wife and myself. and. Uh, we had to keep giving in to each other to accommodate what they wanted to do. So there's a lot of humor in the book and, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, I think everybody is a bit of an Anglophile and it's fun, I think, to read about all these different places all over the country. And this is the back roads tour of Britain. We didn't go to see Stonehenge or the Tower of London or any of those things. Uh, we had seen those earlier, but on this trip, we stayed out in the uh, countryside. You know, I, so I've, I've dug into it a bit. I'm at about page 80 uh, right now. And I have to say the idea of, of having the subtitle say misadventures, uh, similar to, to the, the earlier Naked Mountaineer book, it's spot on really. And everything that I've read so far, uh, there, there's, a, there's a plan or there's a you know, direction and then something comes along. But it, it's just, it's, you write with such a, um, uh, it's it, it's so you, but it's also this very humorous. Uh, you just sit there chuckling as you go along. I have to say, I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the na Naked Mountaineer. You have you have a gift. Uh, where'd you come across that? Uh, you know that gift of writing that way? Because usually us attorneys, we don't write that like that. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you. I, I I'm glad you enjoy the writing. I've had a lot of compliments on the writing itself. Uh, the stories are what they are. They're travel and adventure stories. And some people only read fiction. Some people enjoy armchair traveling and so on. But as to the writing style, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, a few years back was my high school's 50th anniversary, my, my graduation class, 50th anniversary in a small town in Northwest Iowa. And I saw one of my classmates, a woman who I had not had any contact with for 30 or 40 years, maybe at a previous reunion or something, but I hadn't seen her forever. And she came up to me and she said, I just read the Naked Mountaineer book. And she said, I wasn't two paragraphs into it before I realized it sounds just like you. Now she was talking about the me that I was back in high school. So I was a writer in high school. Uh, I did a lot of creative writing in high school and college. I basically had to sort of set that aside for a while, at like 30 or 40 years, or yes, at least 40 years. I had to set that aside to practice law and start my teaching career. But I always knew that was still me, that I'd take a, a humorous look at life and that I like to tell stories I don't think of myself as a good storyteller just face to face. I'm not a raconteur, but I love writing and, and I love writing humorously. And I have a particular style that's very recognizable even to somebody who knew me back in high school. She said, that's you. Wow, I thought, I guess I haven't matured a bit. You know, <laughs> 50 years out from high school, I'm still the same person I was. In, at least that's my writing style. So I, I can't, I don't, my writing style is very clean. I, I'm, not, I'm not really wordy. And I was very influenced by Hemingway when I was a kid. I liked mm -hmm. his minimalist writing style. I thought Hemingway was everything. And, and so I guess I decided that's how writing should be. I was never drawn to the real flowery, verbose, uh, kind of writing. I, I, I get bored so quickly with that. I hate fighting my way through sentences. So I try to keep it clean, that is stylistically and uh, 
pretty wide open. If what you see is what you get, uh, I'm not playing a lot of tricks with my uh, with my storytelling, but I'm glad you're enjoying it. And I know you enjoyed the first book too. And so I do hope uh, people will uh, give it a shot. It's a good read when you're trapped inside, you know, with coronavirus. And, and by the way, uh, the, um, the new book, The Low Mountains or High Tea, has just been released as an audio book. If you go to Audible, if you go to Audible and, and find it, there's a, uh, there's a service called uh, University Audio Press or something like that, that goes and looks at the books that are being published by university publishing houses around the country. And the new book is also published uh, by the University of Nebraska. Uh, and so they select a few books here and there from university publishing houses uh, to, to hire a professional actor to read them and create them as audio books. And it, it was a lot of fun for me to deal with the actor, a fellow who lives out in the Bay Area in California. He got in touch with me and we talked a number of times. He needed help pronouncing some of these words. Sure. And he, he just wanted to know a little bit of who I was. So anyway, it's available as an audiobook. I haven't heard it yet, but my wife and I are about to do a three-day drive from Omaha to uh, the state of Washington for the summer. We're going to listen to my book. <laughs> that should be a strange experience. <laughs> so, um, so, so many questions. Well, first of all, uh, and this is a very popular one right now. If so, you have an actor doing doing the recording. Um, you know, everyone's asking if someone could represent you in a movie, if someone could play you in a movie, who would it be? So I'll, I'll do it for a movie and then the voiceover, uh, you know, uh, do, you, do you have somebody in mind when you think about yourself in a, in a, in a movie or, or oh, yeah, in this case, yeah. reading your book? <laughs> it's got to be Brad Pitt. Right. I, I don't know how it could be anybody else. I mean, look at the resemblance. <laughs> <laughs> I have. <laughs> I, I have to say, it, it is uh, it, it's it's a popular answer right now, right? Didn't Fauci? I think Anthony Fauci used that line, and then uh, Brad Pitt uh, played him. In the I Arsenal thought State. Brad Pitt did a did a fine job on that. So if Brad Pitt can play Anthony Fauci, he could play me. I'm just certain of it. Um, no, I you know, I I hadn't ever thought of that question, but I just gave you the most obvious answer. <laughs> so. Um, so one thing I'm really interested in is your method for for writing and, and getting prepared for your writing. Uh, because a couple of years ago, John Grisham came to town um, and he spoke at UNO and he talked about, you know, it's a grind. I, you know, two to three hours every day. I do it on a computer. I outline and then I write prose, you know, at least two, three pages a day. Um, and then you have people like David Sedaris who, you know, are, are more kind of a memoir of, of their experiences. And he, he writes in his little uh, notebooks every day and then types up those notes in, in a kind of a, a larger form the next day and then sort of writes the stories later on. I, you know, people will just dictate notes into their phone these days and take pictures in between and sort of splice that together. Uh, how did you go about, we'll just talk about the second book here, The, the Low Mountains High Tea. How'd you go about um, getting prepared for, for writing that now that you, you've done that earlier version, the earlier uh, book? Yeah, I'm happy to tell you the first, yeah, I'll just say the first book was much more difficult because I was writing about things that had happened 20 or 30 years earlier. And so I was, uh, I, had, I had collected a bunch of material and files and I'd, I'd been toting those files around all those years. Uh, but that was tough pulling that one together. When we got to Britain, uh, and decided we we're going to do this 30 day road trip, I thought maybe there's another book in this. So I'm going to set myself up to do it. Uh, starting with, um, I find that if I have a photo of something earlier, that really helps because you just pick up a lot from a photo. So I'm a terrible picture taker, but I was much more deliberate about it during the summer in Britain. So I had a lot of photos. The second thing was, uh, I did carry a little notebook in my pocket all the time. And during the day, I would scribble little notes, like a name of a place or a time of day of something. And then the key was this, every single night during the summer, at the end of the day, during the evening, 
I spent about an hour at my laptop writing up a diary for the day. And I would write pages and pages every day. And I would try to, while it was still fresh, I would try to capture the details. And already I was starting to think, what is the fun part of what happened today? You know, what was humorous? What's worth telling in a humorous book? There's a lot of details that are boring. But anyway, I would write this diary every night. And so that by the end of the summer, 90 days on, I had a couple of hundred pages of detailed diary that was very fresh. So writing the second book was much easier because then it was just a matter of picking and choosing from all the things I wrote down, what would make the most amusing story. Now, something as small as the uh, breakfast food, the full English breakfast, you've read what I've written about <laughs> that. Uh, there's more coming on that, by the way. But uh, something as small as that, if you, if you sit down and write your impressions, those sausages were greasy and awful. You know, those baked beans were just disgusting. You, you would write these things down and, and then you, you realize that, you know, at a, a several different places throughout the summer, I had something to say about breakfast. And so that becomes a little story within a story. And uh, also it took a few weeks into the summer for me to get to the decision to try to climb to the highest points of all 15 of the British National Parks. My wife agreed that we could travel around and visit all 15 national parks, which are out in the boondocks. But she wasn't, as you could tell from early on in the book, she was not a hiker. In fact, she got hurt on the first mountain. So uh, she just said, you go off and do that by yourself and save plenty of time for the two of us. So we kind of balanced that out. but. Uh, so at some point then I realized that I had to take good notes to write about those climbs to create a little bit of a record of this thing that I did. I did reach the high points of all the British national parks. Nobody's ever written about that before. I, I, I'm sure other people have done it, but uh, so that became a theme. The whole idea of the food that we were eating because my wife's Italian and she's into food, that became one of the themes. And then the whole cultural thing. How many different ways can you miscommunicate with people who speak the same language? <laughs> so you, you end up with a, a series of themes that, that are recurring and, and that then starts to help frame the story. You know, so I don't wanna give, give away anything um, about, about the read. Again, every single page is sort of, there's a chuckle on every single page. Uh, but one thing that you sort of touch on, and, and again, I've only read the first 80 pages, but it, it, you and, and you, you call your wife the Italian woman, I believe, is, yes. is, is her name. Um, it, you have this back and forth where, where she's like, but why do you want to climb these mountains? And you're like, I, I can't really explain it to you. If you don't get it, you don't get it. Um, but, but I, you know, you've, you've been a climber for yeah your yeah. entire life. And uh, there's something about that that's that's really, uh, it's really important to you. It's really meaningful. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, for those, I, I guess I've had a, a couple of years in New Mexico, um, in Albuquerque, where I got to climb the Sandias. Love that. Um, but can you, can you sort of expound on, for those who don't get it, Flatlanders, uh, what's, what's just so important, magical, majestic about that experience? Well, look, I must have been bored when I was a little kid. And, and in the first book, in the first chapter of The Naked Mountaineer, I talk about the fact that I first saw mountains when I was about 10 years old, when my family took a vacation to Colorado. And they were so different. I, they were so exotic to me. I had grown up in a, you know, in a flat county in Northwest Iowa. And I, I suddenly realized the world is completely different out there. And so I was drawn to mountains. I hadn't seen the ocean at that point in my life, but I was drawn to the mountains because they were so different. And so I decided then and there that I was gonna leave the Midwest. I was gonna move out West and I was gonna live and I was gonna be a mountain climber. For some reason that never left me. And when I finally graduated from law school uh, at the University of Iowa, I, uh, 
moved out to Seattle. And I, I literally started immediately becoming a mountain climber. Uh, it's just so personal to me. Other people can say, well, they look nice. I'd never want to hike in them. You know, I'm not a hiker. I, I was talking to a book club the other day, uh, 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 affiliated with the bookworm here in Omaha. It was a Zoom book club meeting. And this woman says, I, don't, I just don't get it. Why would you want to go hiking in the mountains? Well, as you say, my wife is a little bit like that. Now, she grew up in Seattle, but she's a city girl all the way. And, and um, you know, mountain hiking means nothing to her. But she had, of course, when she married me, she knew what she was getting, and so did I. I knew I wasn't marrying a fellow climber. She was, she was marrying a climber. And so we've had to accommodate that for some years. And uh, yeah, she, she'll never get it. She'll never get why I'm passionate about mountains and why I dream about them all the time. I mean, daydream. Uh, she'll never figure it out, but uh, it's there, you know, and I said that to her. I said, she, why do you want to climb these mountains? I said, well, because they're there, which is a quote from a famous old climber about Mount Everest. I want to climb it because it's there. And she just said to me, do you know how nerdy that sounds? And I said, it couldn't be nerdy. We're talking about mountains, <laughs> you know, anyway. So Dave, you've put your finger on something that I'll never be able to explain, especially to a, uh, an Omaha book club made up of older women who have never climbed mountains in their lives. They had the same thing. In fact, the one woman said, you know, when you got to the climbing parts in that book, I just skipped over them. <laughs> I wasn't that interested. <laughs> But there's something to, there's always going to be another mountain to climb. Yeah. There's always going to be even another path on the same mountain or a different time of yeah. year or different weather. It's, it, it's, um, you're, you're never really doing the same thing twice, even if it looks like the same thing. And so it's always a, a new adventure, a new mission to accomplish. Uh, and that's, that's pretty special too, is that it's, it's, it's a unique thing every single time. Well, I'll give you an example of how what I don't understand, I don't understand running. Uh, and, you know, I know lots of people who are into running and they have all these different routes that they like to run, but they, they get off on uh, going to half marathons or quarter marathons or something, 5K runs, and they like to go around to different places. Oh, you know, down in, in Nebraska City, there's gonna be a 5K, let's go down and run the 5K. And I just say, why you know why would you why would you want to do something like that but but it's the same i think for them uh they they enjoy the experience and then you build in a community by going out and doing a, a a fun run which doesn't make any sense to me at all because i don't run but you you build a community you you get a checklist you know you have your checklist of, of places where you've run marathons or whatever uh, so I, I just think it's natural for people to find something that they like, or even better, are really passionate about and can't do without, and then try in their lifetime to build in those experiences wherever and whenever they can. Well, we've been living in Omaha the past 15 years, not a lot of mountain climbing going on. Although for some, for a few years, we had a little place that we bought up in Colorado. So we would go for the summer and, and go hiking and so up there. But uh, in fact, my, my dog who is lying at my feet here has been up six or seven of the 14ers in Colorado with me. So we've, you know, we've found other ways to get out to the mountains, but yeah, it's pretty personal. Well, and, um... This is probably more of a name drop than than I, I should, but I, I'm right now I'm reading um, Zen and the art of, art of motorcycle maintenance, and you know he goes through a, a, a mystical religious semi religious experience through his hiking, um, and so if, if somebody's looking for trying to make that connection uh, in a book, um, there's your your books, and there's also that one which is which is a pretty good read as well. Uh, 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 Zen and the motorcycle art of motorcycle maintenance is it is a fantastic book it's a lot how can i put it it's a lot more philosophical 
than mine. Uh, he gets off into some very strange uh, mental spaces in that book. And uh, that's why it's a work of art. Mine is, mine is just light reading, I would say. Mine, mine, you know, I hope though, I mean, some people have said, look, it's more than just a beach read. It's more than just an airplane read, what you've written, because you bring out yourself, you bring out who you are and what mean, what's important to you. And so anytime anybody writes, I think is a philosophy. There's, they're bringing in some of their own philosophy, even if they're trying to keep it light. Well, in, uh, in the Zen book, it wasn't light at all. Uh, <laughs> no. It was disturbing at times very colorful, very interesting. Actually, I read it for the first time just a couple of years ago. It was, I saw it as a road book and I've been enjoying uh, some of the other uh, road books like uh, there's a book called Blue Highways by uh, a Native American author named William Least Heat Moon. Lovely book. And then there's John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. So I think travel books are partly informative, but also philosophical. So, absolutely, yeah. There's there's some there's something about it, and and the rhythm to a travel book, it just it's kind of baked in to it. And if the author can sort of use that um, use that rhythm in the way that they write, it it just really flows well. I think. Um, so, how is the editing process working with an editor and getting it from from you know manuscript drafts to Sure. Final copy. The uh, University of Nebraska Press is uh, is not a commercial press with thousands of employees who can just you know they can take a book that's very popular, the commercial press, and get it out in a matter of weeks or so. The uh, Nebraska process is a lot slower. It's about a year and a half actually from the moment that they accepted the book. Let's take the second one. Actually, they were both pretty much the same. It took then a year and a half to get it uh, out. Um, it took some months, maybe three or four months or five or six months to even get it onto the editor's schedule. So mm -hmm. once they accepted it, he put it on, he put it in his queue. And then um, we were actually editing the Naked Mountaineer during my trip through Britain if you can think of it that way. So at every night, not only was I keeping my diary of what we were doing in Britain, but I was exchanging pages with my editor in Lincoln um, uh, on the Naked Mountaineer. So uh, anyway, the editor told me, and he's edited a lot of books. He told me I was one of the easiest uh, clients he had ever worked with because my writing was so clean. Uh, uh, he, he edits a lot of sports memoirs, uh, famous baseball players and that, that sort of, and they're not great writers and whoever their ghost writers are, aren't great writers. And so he's, he, he, he really works hard to try to get those books, uh, in shape. He did not have to work that hard on mine, but basically he had the manuscript. He would, uh, come back a few chapters at a time with comments and say, I think you overstated this and why don't you tone this down a little bit or could you say a few more words about that? There wasn't a lot of that, but basically then I would quickly respond and get it back to him. So I actually felt that the editing process was completely smooth. Now, when he was done, then it goes into what's called production. And that's about a 12 month process where First of all, they've got to get some people in the print room to lay it, you know, to format it and put it in page format and print it out. And that involves choosing a font and uh, choosing a chapter heading style and all of that. Uh, that's just a very slow process. But then they go, it goes at some point in there, it goes through copy editing and they hire a special person. These are freelance people. Mine was uh, I asked for the same woman who did the first book to do the second one. Uh, she lives in Ann Arbor and uh, she was going through it with the fine tooth comb to make sure every semicolon was correct and that italics were properly used. So she's got the Chicago manual of style in her head 
And so that actually, that copy editing process took longer than the content editing. Uh, so, but, but th that woman and I worked really well together too. And she would tell me to change something and I would say, no, because, you know, mm -hmm. mostly I'm just grateful for anything she could do to make sure there were no typos and that sort of thing. Uh, the, so the content editing, then the copy editing and the, and the composition and then cover design uh, that turned out to be uh, in the first book, quite a battle. I wasn't happy with the first cover they proposed. And, and uh, anyway, I had a different cover in mind than we ended up with, but uh, ultimately I found, uh, I found this picture online, which is appropriate because it's got a picture of an inn and a low mountain in the background. And so there you get your high T and your low mountains. But I found that online and it was available through iStock or one of those picture services and Nebraska subscribes to that. So they just have to pay a royalty for that photo. But then you get the composition that goes with it, which is the uh, font for the title and the font for the author name and, and the look of the back cover and all that. I found that part to be a lot of fun, even though I had to fight a little bit to get it the way I wanted it. Also, by the way, uh, on the first book, I fought pretty hard over the font of the type in the book. I'd, the first font that they ran it out in was too tight. I didn't think it was as readable as it should be. And so I fought with them to get a quarter of a point larger font, a quarter of a point, which made it much more uh, readable in my opinion. So when we started the second book, I said, I want the same font, same size, same font. Please don't force me to go to battle over that. So uh, as you can tell, I'm a little bit nerdy about these things and I'll tell you why. When I was a freshman in college at Iowa State, I had a part-time job working in a print shop and so, uh, and they printed the Iowa State Daily Newspaper. And so I was totally immersed for a year in layout and fonts and margin justification and all of that stuff. So ever since then, I've been very attentive to it. And I think it helps as a writer to be that attentive. Well, and, and it, it certainly affects um, reading and, you know, I, <laughs> Maybe there's some uh, some minor dyslexia in the way I read, but when I have, when there's a good font and it's spaced right and it's the right size, all of that is very important to ease of reading. And so I, I think it really does matter. Well, you um, know, Dave, if I'm at a bookstore and there's a book I want to read, and I pull it off the shelf, I'll open it up, and if the font is too small or too tight, I won't buy the book. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, I'm, you know, I'm getting older and, and eye strain is, uh, you know, is a little more of an issue, but I also think uh, uh, I need to do justice to my readers and give them something that's readable in, in the sense of font. So uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm, that's another nerdy thing you have to kind of get into. <laughs> Look, you lay out the, the uh, OBA newsletter uh, or magazine that comes out you know what we're talking about. You have to be very attentive to layout, uh, style of the font and the size of the headings and all that. You want it to look nice because an attractive page is like an attractive plate at a restaurant. You're gonna read it more. If it's just boring, you're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna wanna read it. So you know what I'm talking about, but the same thing happens, I think in, uh, if I may say, I teach, uh, a course in contract drafting at the law school. And I keep harping to my students about how the layout of a contract with subheads and italics and boldface and whatever it is you're gonna do, use the layout tools that you have in your computer to make your contract attractive and readable. Uh, so those are skills that I actually was using for all my years at law practice uh, that I, uh, and, and I've done battle with law reviews over the font and the style and all that. So 
I think if, if anytime you write for someone else, you owe it to them to make it as attractive as possible. And, and that's where I think the, the OBA newsletter comes out looking quite well. I think it's uh, very handsome. Well, I, I appreciate that. I have to actually apologize to Dan Smith. Um, he, he, he put his opus out there on common law in this last edition and he, he just had too many pages. And so we had, to, we had to push that down to a font that was maybe a bit uh, less comfortable to read uh, in print version. Digital, maybe you could blow it up a bit, but uh, it was, I, was, I was one of those, uh, those editors sitting there and saying, you know, we have to do this in, in pages of four, so we need it to be of a certain size. Um, and, and we ended up hopefully still readable, but it's, it's tough. And, you, you got to walk that line and serif versus sans serif, you know, there are yep. web fonts, yep. there are, there are paper fonts. Um, it, I love it. And I think there was a documentary a couple of years ago, Helvetica, uh, you know, about fonts and, and the, the beauty of fonts. I, we're in a golden age of, of actually new fonts that have never existed before. There are a lot of freelance people out there that are, that are making their own fonts. Yeah. Um, I, I like to nerd about, out about this and say, you should consider if you're a, a law firm um, or a lawyer that's that's at a law firm, consider having a a, a font for your law firm, a, a branded font that you yeah. use for all your emails and for your written material and everything like that. Great idea. Use that as a brand. Yeah. Um, and you can you can find one that's not necessarily been used by other people. Uh, Times New Roman, please, please don't use that if you don't have to. There are a lot of right. good alternatives out there that right maybe catch an eye a little bit better so but don't get too cute right don't get too windings cute. uh or symbols yeah no. yeah i i've <laughs> seen no i mean i've i've seen uh not only law firms but any kind of uh service whether it's retail or or, or service industry uh play around and get just a little bit too cute on on their font and and if it's too cute it's you don't want to read it but yeah, I like that idea, Dave. So, so we have two nerdy font people talking here. That's right. Well, and and now that I've now I've talked to you about it, I need to I need to go out and I need to make sure all the web pages are are all the same. I need to for the next edition. I need to make sure. I mean, we're using like a Minion Pro, I think this last one. Um, but now I have to now I have to walk the walk. So uh, this just got my to-do list a little bit longer today, but that's okay. I, I, I really do appreciate uh, having this conversation with you. Again, the two books, The Naked Mountaineer, um, which is, is the old classic about your younger years and now Low Mountains High Tea or High Tea. Um, uh, they're both out University of Nebraska Press. I've seen them on Amazon. So if you have a Kindle, you can download it or you can you can buy yeah, it on there. Absolutely. But on University of Nebraska Press, I think it's even on, on Google and obviously now on Audible. Oh, it's, it's um, available. Yeah, and if I may put in a plug, uh, go to the bookworm and get it. Oh, no, well, it's hard to shop these days, but- Call them and, and um, have them I drop would, it off. No, I would, order, I would order from the bookworm first uh, with almost anything I want because I want to support the independent bookstores. So do that, please. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you for your time today, uh, Professor. I know that you're you're traveling out to um, to Seattle area. Uh, safe travels to you and your thank wife, you. and uh, and we'll talk to you soon. And we'll we'll do that ethics seminar here uh, online here here later this summer. So thank you. I'll, I'll wear a shirt and tie for the ethics seminar, Dave. <laughs> so okay. will I. <laughs> Deal. Okay. All right. Thank Take you, care. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.